Our next hero is well known to everybody, very modest, and uh, in her own right, uh, as a peace activist, is, is doing an outstanding job. Um, Colleen Rowley is a former member of the FBI and also a Time Magazine Person of the Year. And she's here to talk about Paul's efforts and initiatives. And, you know, Colleen has done an outstanding job of trying to help Paul Wellstone's philosophy appearing on the peace process. Ladies and gentlemen, Colleen Rowley. Thank you. I, I hope, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk tonight on what would Wellstone do. Gave me the opportunity to, to develop a new t-shirt yesterday. And um, I am actually, don't have the longest history. Many people go way back with Wellstone and have uh, really long-standing stories. I had a friend in the peace community who sent me this little uh, paragraph that I want to read. It goes further back. I first met Paul Wellstone at Carleton College in 1982 when we were both doing education about nuclear weapons. He was passionate then about the increasingly reckless talk about waging and winning a limited nuclear war. But he was also passionate about power lines being imposed on farms, about unions, and generally about anything that harmed the millions of little people in our country as in people without much power compared to corporations. That passion for human rights for everyone dominated his life and drove him to be a superb and completely reliable advocate for human beings. It got him to the Senate against amazing odds. It animated his success at getting more resources for treatment of mental illnesses and a hundred other issues. It caused him to be one of the very few dissenting voices in the rush to war in Iraq that we have now seen was based on distortions and outright lies. It caused him to be a great man, and far more rare, a great man who was genuinely loved by many thousands of little people, little people in quotes, who recognized his genuine character and concern for their problems in life. My story, and I'm just going to tell you about my little personal connection to Paul Wellstone, nobody knows, probably very few people know this. Um, I had met him uh, because when, my, when I would get new bosses, I had to take him around to meet senators, so I had met him like that, and uh, I handled the congressional inquiries in my office in, uh, up until 2003. So I actually developed a pretty close connection to Tom Lapick who was one of the staffers who died, because he also handled the congressional inquiries from constituents in his office. Um, but but um, I'll tell you the story. I was standing in uh, either Grassley or Leahy's office on J June 6th, right before I was going to testify to the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I had Orrin Hatch on one side, I had Leahy, I had Grassley over here, and they were talking to me last minute, you know, buffing me up for the, the thing. And in, actually, Paul Wellstone comes busting through the door, and he actually pushed them aside. Leahy's a pretty big guy. And he just pushed them aside and lifted me up. And I, and I went, oh my gosh, I didn't know we knew each other this well. I mean, he lifted me off the ground. And uh, it turned out that, you know, when people say, how come you're the only whistleblower who was able to survive? It's just gotten worse and worse. Uh, there, are, there are six prosecutions of whistleblowers now under Obama, twice as many under the 1917 Espionage Act as in all, of, uh, all other presidents. And uh, they aren't surviving. Uh, the, the one guy today, the CIA operative, who uh, blew the whistle on torture on waterboarding, was forced to plead guilty and is going to prison for two and a half years. So most of these whistleblowers that have been persecuted have not been able, as I was, to, re to retire with a pension. Um, it turned out one of the main things that saved me, it turned out, was Paul Wellstone, uh, uh, Mark Dayton, the two senators from Minnesota, and Leahy and Grassley, the four of them, 
I don't know if they, you know, worked with each other or they just all did them separately. But there were four letters that went into the FBI director that said, don't fire Colleen Rowley. And, and so, um, you know, I really owed a lot to Paul Wellstone. I had not ever voted for Paul Wellstone. And in the summer, after I testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee, and you get to October, and I was realizing that this was completely based on, you know, distortion and lie, as, as uh, my friend said. And, um, and then we had Paul Wellstone give this speech, one, one of only 23 senators, and the only senator who was up for re-election. And his own staff, I, I learned this later when I went through the Wellstone training, uh, I learned from one of his staffers that his staffers had recommended that due to the re-election, that he should go with the flow and not, not say those things about the war being based on distortions and, and being preemptive and, and going, going to be counterproductive. So um, I, maybe a week after this happened, and by the way, just, just think about what he said there and how John Kerry later on when he runs says none of us would have known that this authorization uh, for war would have was meant that. Of course, that was the, the secondary, I don't know how many lies are involved here, but that was a lie. Of course, Paul Wellstone knew what this meant. Um, so I actually had a huge change uh, in October. And I was out on one of my runs, and I said to my running group, just guess who I'm going to vote for in uh, whatever it was, three weeks, four weeks. I said, just guess. You're never going to believe who I've decided to vote for. And of course, they guessed and guessed, and no one could guess. And I said, I'm going to vote for Paul Wellstone. Because, and it's not because he helped save my job by writing a letter. It's because he is the only person with this word right here, conscience. And, you know, uh, later on, someone came and gave me this book, and I've read parts of it, but this now, in our day and era, there's no conscience left. I've had people write to me after the debate last night that likening the two presidential candidates practically as if they were talking on, on like mafia talk, and how you take out people. You know, we, we um, the, the CIA operative is going to prison, for leaking uh, about waterboarding, but not a soul in government is going to prison for waterboarding. And even worse than this now, we're almost on a complete repeat of the lead up to the Iraq war. If you remember, uh, the month or week, couple of weeks before the Iraq war, they were so effective in what Clawson is talking about there, how to produce how to manipulate people into going to war when there's no reason. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall we had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. But one can combine other means of pressure with sanctions. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? <laughs> we can do a variety of things if we wish to increase the pressure. I'm not advocating that. But I'm just suggesting that uh, it, it, it's, this, this is not a, a either-or proposition of, you know, it's just sanctions has to, has to succeed or other things. We are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier at that. And he says, well, we have to have these false flags and, and these uh, traumatic Pearl Harbors in order to get people. 
They were able, in a couple of weeks before the Iraq war started, to get 70% of the American public to believe that Saddam was behind 9-11. Now that is absolutely incredible. And they, they actually, uh, when they finally replay uh, what they said, uh, Cheney was very careful a couple of times in giving himself little bits of wiggle room and so he could say, I never lied to the American public and told them that Saddam was behind it, but they did everything but outright explicit lie. And they got most of the people. Guess what's happening now? They've got about the same percentage of people that believe that Iran has, wep um, has a nuclear weapon. They believe that Iran already has a nuclear weapon. People in D.C. all talk this way. So, what do we need to do? We, we need certainly to remember, uh, definitely need to remember Paul Wellstone. Keep, keep your bumper sticker, the little green bumper stickers with Wellstone, because we need to keep that spirit alive. But I think actually now we need to revive the spirit. We need to revive. Listen to those last five minutes of his speech. And everyone now, go contact your congressional leaders. I will be happy to make a t-shirt for anyone <laughs> that is going to do this. It says, what, um, what would Wellstone do? And if you are willing to try your hardest, as Wellstone did before the Iraq War, to now prevent the, you know, much, much worse. It's guaranteed a war on Iran is guaranteed to be worse than Afghanistan and Iraq and many times worse. And so we need to be doing a lot, lot more than what we're doing now. We need to get Wellstone spirit back, and uh, uh, and actually, we need. You know, the conscience in the United States now is at an all-time low. We frankly need to get a conscience back. That's what we need to do. So thank you very much. <laughs>